Today, we have Anneke Kremer here, for, um, who's a microscopy specialist at the VIB Bioimaging Core and Flanders Bioimaging Node. Um, Anneke got her PhD from KU Leuven. And since 2012, you have been working at the VIB, first as a postdoc and now as a microscopy specialist. And you are focusing on the developing protocols for volume EM and CLEM workflows with a particular focus on serial block phase, SEM and FIPSEM. And the title of the talk today is From Micrometers to Nanometers, Workflows for Volume EM and CLEM. And I welcome Anneke. Thank you very much for being here. Okay, so first of all, thank you everyone for um, joining today and coming to listen. And thank you for your bioimaging for the invitation. Uh, for having me speak here. So I'm Anneke, and the introduction already uh, told you a little bit about what I do. Um, I just have a little bit of introduction about VIB. So VIB is the Flemish uh, Institute for, um, yeah, this isn't going too far, no. Uh, Flemish Institute for Biotechnology. So we are located in Flanders, the Dutch speaking part of Belgium. And the Institute is affiliated with uh, all the main universities in Flanders. So there's nine different uh, institutes within VIB uh, with a research interest ranging from structural biology to plant systems biology. So as a bioimaging core, this mainly means we get a lot of different samples that we have to deal with and we have to uh, process and handle. Um, so the bioimaging core, um, quickly go back, is actually um, um, located in two locations. So we are in Ghent and there is a sister facility in Leuven. Uh, the equipment that we have is slightly tailored to the institute that we're, of course, embedded in, uh, but we work together and we uh, try and give the best service to every user. Um, <clears throat> now in Ghent, um, we have light and electron microscopy ranging from the basic light microscopes to our two volume EMs, to our two volume EM systems. Um, and basically this slide is to show that uh, today I'm mainly going to focus on the volume EM and the electron microscopy uh, side of things. I'll be showing a few light microscopy images from the CLAM workflows, but that's um, uh, the work of my colleagues, basically. Um, so volume EM uh, actually started in the bioimaging core at the same time as I did. So in 2012, we got uh, two systems for volume EM. Uh, on the one hand, we got a Merlin with a tree view for serial block phase SEM. And uh, in addition, we got a focused ion beam SEM. So these are the two um, SEM based systems for volume EM volume EM basically. Um, and in the uh, more than 10 years that I've been there already, things have evolved quite a bit. Um, also our handling and um, usage of the system has evolved quite a lot. Um, but for the people that don't know, I'm quickly going to give a short introduction for each of these systems. Um, so serial block phase SEM, as we call it, it uh, is an SEM which has a three view unit uh, three view door attached to it in our case. Um, and this door is basically a fully automated ultra microtome that is installed inside the vacuum chamber. So what we do, we put our sample block inside the system. It's imaged with the SEM, the surface, and then the, the diamond knife cuts away a section. <clears throat> and this uh, happens automatically and we can image up to 2000, 3000 sections depending on the sample. Uh, now, with the diamond knife, we can section uh, as thin as 50 nanometer, so 50 to 100 nanometer is what we standardly do, and in XY we get 5 to 10 nanometer pixels, um, leading to data sets that look like this. So we can uh, image quite a large range, so uh, I think the maximum is about 400 by 400 micrometers, where you still have nanometer resolution and information. So you can uh, image rather large areas for electron microscopy. <clears throat> you see here is mouse liver, where we have traced some of the blood vessels and then uh, this Kupfer cell here that's uh, situated in the middle. We'll come back to those cells later and give more explanation. <clears throat> the focused ion beam, on the other hand, um, works a little bit differently. So here we have our SEM beam and in addition, a focused ion beam. Uh, this is a beam that uh, actually propels gallium ions towards your surface. And with this, we can mill very uh, precisely and also very thin sections. So we're sectioning here at five nanometers 
And as we can also in XY image at five nanometers, we have um, isotropic voxels, meaning in the reconstructions, these are very uh, nice and smooth reconstructions, and they are very, um, uh, that can be very helpful in viewing things in three dimensions. Now, because of the method here, we are quite limited in the area that we can image, so it's a bit smaller. So for the facility, mostly the uh, project for tissues and that want to look at the connection between cells go to the zero block phase and in the FIPSAM we mainly image cells or uh, projects where they want to uh, look at intracellular um, events. So here as an example of an HeLa cell where we were looking at the interactions between the mitochondria and the ER. So you see that um, in a minute there's very nice segmentations of the mitochondria in green and then the contact sites uh, with the ER are uh, mapped out in purple, <clears throat> as you see it here. Uh, yeah, so um, for these volume EM systems, sample preparation in the beginning was quite of a search because um, we hadn't done it before. And when we started out, it was quite a new technique. Um, <clears throat> now for electron microscopy, um, the sample has to um, uh, has to follow certain rules. So in the electron microscope, there's a vacuum. So the sam sample should be able to um, um, withstand the vacuum and not collapse. Uh, and since it's electron microscope, um, samples need to be conductive. Now, biological samples and also the resin that we embed them in are really not conductive. So we need to add, uh, so we add a lot of uh, heavy metals. And while for, for example, for transmission electron microscopes, we, you make sections and you can stain the section afterwards. For volume EM, we need to make sure that this uh, contrast or the conductivity needs, uh, has, uh, is present inside the block before we put it in the microscope. <clears throat> so there are several uh, protocols that we use as our basic protocols, but depending really on the sample that comes through the door, we tweak or adjust a little bit to make sure that we, um, stain, yeah, we have the best staining for that sample. Now for serial block phase, the standard sample, standard protocol that we use is the one from Daring et al. in 2010. I think a lot of people use this protocol, uh, but it, uh, is, it comprises of incubation and osmium, uh, TCH, another osmium, uranyl acetate and Walton's lead. Um, and depending on the sample, we sometimes add ruthenium red or an extra osmium step. Um, all depends a bit. Uh, for the FIPSAM, um, we can get away with a little bit, little bit less contrasts. We don't have as much charging artifacts, uh, so we have different protocols for that. Um, <clears throat> the main thing I want to mention here, so instead of urinal acetate, we use urinal acetate replacement uh, stain. Um, as urinal acetate is becoming more difficult to use, uh, some countries uh, don't allow the use of it anymore. So we have a replacement. Uh, we just tested it and it worked for volume EM. So we kept on using it. Um, yeah, that is that. Now, our, I'm going to show a few of the things we did for optimization of the sample preparation and later on show some CLAM workflows. And I'm going to start with uh, some optimization we did for serial block phase. Now our system, so the Merlin we have, is a high vacuum system. This allows us to image at a high resolution, but also um, has some challenges, as uh, especially with the plastic, the yeah, resin embedded samples. Um, we get a lot more charging than you would in a variable pressure system or something where you could adjust a bit more. Um, now, this charging can take different forms and in a sample like brain tissue, which is very dense and which stains really nicely. It's not, uh, these are not big issues. Uh, for example, here, Drosophila brain, we do get some drifts here at the top. So the image, the beam starts scanning at the top of the image and you see there is some drift. Um, this actually happens when um, your uh, knife sections, while well, your knife sections, the, the beam is blanked, but after the knife is removed, the beam hits the sample again and you get some initial drift. And you see that here at the top. We can easily uh, crop that out or remove that if we want. But for other samples where we need to tweak the protocol and cannot work with a lot of contrast, um, we see these dark areas here that are also charging. Uh, in a microscope. And this is a lot more difficult to work with because it really obscure, obscures your data uh, below. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, now, in addition to the protocols that we use, so the staining we put in, the sample mounting also has a big effect, can have a big effect on charging. So we try to optimize this as much as possible. So what we do uh, for the serial block phase, the samples are mounted or the, on these aluminum pins. Uh, we use a conductive epoxy as glue. Uh, the pieces we put on there are as small as possible, so we cut away most of the empty resin where possible. Um, also, the tissue itself should make contact with the pin, so there cannot be an empty, uh, a layer of empty resin in between. All sides are smoothly trimmed with a diamond knife and we coat with a thin layer of platinum. <clears throat> but even then, there are samples like, for example, Arabidopsis leaf. Where there is biological material, it's stained nicely, but there are large areas where there is no more biological material where, material where you're just imaging um, bare resin, and that causes the charging. There's not much more we can do about that for now. But um, when we started in 2012, um, we first did our first test with this uh, protocol by Tom Deering, and they used Durkepan resin. Um, and this Durkepan resin is a specific composition of the resins. There is a whole list, a whole variety of different ones that you can use. But Durkepan is quite viscous. So specifically for plant tissue and also the cardiac muscle that I showed before, it's really difficult to get this infiltrated well into the tissue. So quite early on already, we switched to spur resin, which is a low viscosity. But then after a while, we noticed that uh, there's a difference between the resins and how they behave in the microscope, specifically looking at the charging. So spur charges a lot more than Durkepan does. So we were thinking maybe we can optimize this a little bit and find a resin that works uh, best. So Durkepan has a good contrast, um, limited charging, but is very viscous. So it's difficult to infiltrate into specific tissues. And then spur is low viscosity, but it has a lot of charging. Um, <clears throat> so our requirements for serial block phase, we wanted low viscosity, easy handling, a good contrast in the SEM, and then limited charging, of course. Now, one of the first things that we did is follow uh, the publications that came out and see what is everyone else using. Um, so my colleague, Peter Borghev, um, he... Um, followed this and in the end i think he checked 278 different papers um, in materials and methods he checked which resins uh, have they used um, and we divided them here in different categories so you have durkepan apon like um, these are all the different names that they were um, called in the in the materials and methods low viscosity resin uh, tab which are three components uh, compared to the four components of the ones above and then acrylic or special resins that were only mentioned once in one paper now the most used is Durkepan, probably because it's used in this uh, first protocol that was published for serial block phase also epon is still used a lot but the third uh, largest category is also the category unknown. So this means in 23% of the papers, we could not identify which resin was used. So people use epoxy or just resin in the materials and methods, and that makes it hard to replicate. <clears throat> well, most of the papers, they do state which resin they use, but they do not really state which composition of the resin was used. So there also, when we want to replicate or see what do we choose for our comparison, we had to kind of guess a little bit. However, in the end, we uh, chose six different resins. So Durkepan, Tab, Alex 112, Embed, Spur, and Ella White. Um, and we used two different sample types. So mouse liver, this is a very dense tissue and uh, a rather conductive sample. And then not adherent hack cells in a palette, which uh, have a lot more bare resin around them. So they would be more challenging. Um, after sample preparation, all the blocks uh, that were mounted on the pin were made sure that they were the same size and height so that the mounting wouldn't cause any variability in the charging or in the imaging. And then we <clears throat> started different tests. <clears throat> so the first test was actually done before sample prep. So when the resins were just mixed, all the components, we checked the viscosity. And Durkepan was actually the highest. And Aloe White is basically water and all the others are in between. So TAP is also maybe a bit high, uh, but the others are quite low in viscosity still. Um, <clears throat> now, um, 
So the samples were prepared, the pins were made, and we first put them in the SEM and tried different um, uh, different KVs. So we uh, just increased it every time. And you see from 2 kV on, you see the areas that have less biological um, material, like blood vessels and nuclei, they charge. Um, but they're, in all the resins, it's not really anything that really obscures it, except for spur. But we already suspected that it was really more, more prone to charging. <clears throat> now, we our standard runs are usually done uh, between 1.5 or 2 kV. So when we uh, take a closer look at these uh, KVs and look at the ultrastructure and the contrast, Durkepan is nice, it's used a lot, so we look, thought it looked really good and bad as well. Spur at 1.5 kV gives a really sharp, nice image. So at lower KVs, it's really good. But um, strangely, both Alex 112 and Ella White, they at 1.5 kV kept blurry. So both me and my colleague tried to get nicely focused image there and we couldn't. And we have no explanation for that, but just an observation then at this point. <clears throat> um, OK, so the next step was to do short runs on each of the samples. Um, we decided to do that at 2 kV, where there's already a little bit charging to see if we could um, stress it a little bit. <clears throat> but um, if you look at this, there is not much difference between them. So all of the samples, they section nicely. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, charging artifacts, so you don't see much in the nuclei, but uh, there's some movement uh, between sections, but not as much, except for spur, of course, but that charges a lot more. Um, but all in all, there's not much difference between the resins like this. Now, as I said before, the liver is the really conductive sample. So we want to stress the system a bit more. And that's why we also had the palleted hex cells. So these cells, they are in a pallet. And then we um, um, put this pallet in agarose. So they, they are processed in, uh, as a complete block. Um, but still, these cells are all separate. And there is bare resin. Uh, around them, uh, much more than we would have in the liver samples. <clears throat> so already when we did the KV test, you see the difference. So we cannot go higher than 2 kV. You see that it's already completely black. Um, and at 1.25 and 1.5 kV, it's more or less OK. But you see in all the KVs, you see still charging artifacts there. Taking a closer look again, um, it again for me, it stands out that Spur gives really nice, crisp images. So despite the charging, it's a good resin for imaging. Alex and Ella White are a bit blurry again <clears throat> here as well. Now, when we did runs at 1.5 kV, you already see quite a bit more di oh, sorry, difference. Yeah. OK, so you see these two, Alex and Ella White, they are moving around, losing focus. The coupon is charging too much. So not sure what's going on there. And the others, they showed charging, but it's quite OK in movement. And loss of focus uh, was also quite limited. So for these through three, we also checked at 1.25 kV. <clears throat> and I hope you can see that this is already a lot better. So we can image. Um, and for us here, embed was really uh, the nicest. <clears throat> now, in conclusion, I can't say that there is a resin that I wouldn't use. They all work. Uh, and it's all possible um, if you um, adjust it a little bit. But for us in the facility, at the moment, we switched everything to embed 8 and 12. And we also uh, still use spur sometimes, uh, for also for older samples that are already embedded. Um, yeah. So that um, concludes the, the first part. Now, <clears throat> for charging. I wanted to add this slide. So when we started the resin comparison study, uh, this focal charge compensator that is now out, that is now available, wasn't there yet. Um, so the FCC is this little needle here inside the tree view that uh, can blow nitrogen over the surface of the block. And the nitrogen uh, actually locally lowers the vacuum and um, is able to dissipate the charging. So when it's off, you see the charging, but when it's on, it's a lot different. So this really helps for samples that are really difficult to image, to be able to image them as well. Now, 
our resin comparison, we still went through with it because um, uh, I think for now the FCC is only possible on Zeiss systems. And for our older system, it doesn't really like the FCC very much. Um, so our iron gatton pump suffers quite a bit, so we don't use it that often anymore. <clears throat> So now I'm returning a little bit to this slide um, because uh, I've talked a lot about the zero block phase, but we also have a FIPSAM where we didn't play around as much uh, for protocols, mainly because it can take quite a lot more. So we can get away with less contrast. It doesn't charge as much. And that's mainly because the system is a little bit more diff little bit different. So I already explained it a little bit. So we have this focused IM beam at the side and the SEM. And basically, um, the milling happens um, in the direction of the focused IM beam. Uh, so the sample is turned, meaning that your sectioning happens perpendicular to the surface of your sample. So from the side, it looks like this. We first have to make this trench to open up a surface to image, and then we can mill. This also means that um, we uh, only um, open up a little bit of the bare resin or plastic to the surface, so we have a lot less charging in this case. <clears throat> uh, explaining maybe why uh, less contrast also works for this. Yeah. Um, now, staying in the resin comparison, I thought let's try the different resins in the FIPSEM as well and see if there's a difference. Now, you see this is stained for zero block phase. It's quite heavily stained for the FIPSEM. It's quite dark, but also the staining was exactly the same. It's just the resin that's different between these two samples. Um, so you see the resin really has an impact also on how the samples look um, uh, contrast-wise. And then the panel here on the side is the YZ view. So from the side, you see all these lines. Uh, that is the milling consistency. So the milling throughout the, the run that wasn't very stable specifically, especially for Durkpan, but also here in TAP, you see these lines. <clears throat> now this can, um, happened due, due to a lot of reasons, but as these samples were more or less the same, they were mounted in the same way and the they were done in the same week, so the system was quite stable as well. Um, here, I think it's really due to the resin. And if we compare all of them, Spur is actually the best one here. So it doesn't mill, um, that, that ink milling is more consistent with Spur resin. Now from all the resins, Spur is actually the hardest or the most brittle in my case, so I, in my feeling. So maybe it has to do with the fact that it's quite hard, so it mills more consistently. Not sure here. <clears throat> um, yeah, a little bit about the samples, mainly what I wanted to stay here. I forgot to move the slide, but we um, mount samples either on SEM stubs or on the zero block face pins also work. And then in this case, we sputter with 20 nanometers of platinum. So it's quite a thick layer, but that's just to protect the complete surface from damage for the FIB beam uh, and also uh, prevent charging. And then here you see the little hole that's opened for, um, for the actual imaging. Uh, now, to target a cell or a region where there is at least tissue, we image at 15 kV to see through the platinum, so we can actually see where uh, our tissue or the cells are located, like this. <clears throat> um, yep. <clears throat> then we have some images to show that uh, even with only osmium or low osmium, like high pressure frozen samples, we get really uh, nice imaging in the um, FIPSEM, which wouldn't be possible in a zero block phase. Um, yeah. Okay. Now I talked a little bit already about the targeting. So in the FIPSEM, also in the zero block phase, we all only see the surface of your sample. Um, and then in the FIP, we, we need to increase the KV to actually be able to see what we're doing. Um, but we don't know what's what's going on underneath. And we also cannot distinguish between cells. We don't see the difference or whether they were fluorescent or not. Um, we just see the outline of the cells. So if we want to target a specific cell or a specific area, we need more extra navigation. We need uh, more information to be able to image the right area here. And that leads me to the last part of my, part of my talk, which are the correlative light and electromicroscopy workflows. <clears throat> Um, now I'm going to start with uh, 
styles. So uh, the most straightforward CLAM workflow is actually just finding the cell of interest. So maybe these are cells that are uh, transfected. They usually come with a label. So there is GFP there. So you recognize in the light microscope, OK, this cell has gotten the plasmid. Has, is expressing the plasmid that I want to look at. So this is a cell of interest. Now in the light microscope with fluorescence, it's easy to see, but after sa EM sample preparation, this fluorescence is gone <clears throat> and the cells are completely black. And then additionally in the SEM, we don't see uh, fluorescence anyway. So we need additional navigation to be able to target the specific cell. Now for cells, it's straightforward. Um, as we can grow cells in these dishes, these are gridded cover slips. So in the circle here, a cover slip is mounted that is, has this grid imprinted on it. So um, in the light microscope, you find your cells of interest, you image them, whatever you need. And then we usually take tile scans where you can see the grids. I hope it translates on the screen. So you see all these grids here and the numbers. Um, so we can... Uh, find out which grid this was in. Then sample preparation for EM happens inside these dishes. And um, afterwards, the grid is imprinted on the sample block. And when we put that in the FIPSEM, in the SEM, you actually see, you see the grid uh, a lot better even than in the light microscope. <clears throat> so just flipping it and then um, using also the shape of the cells and the grid and the position in the grid where they are, we can easily find back the cell of interest. Now, if it's just to find um, a transfected cell or a cell of interest, this is all we need. Now we can image and we're done. But in some cases uh, where people want to um, uh, get more contacts for a protein they're interested in, we also need to make overlays between the light microscopy and the electron microscopy data sets. Um, and because there's quite a big difference in resolution, so LM sections are somewhere in the way of uh, hundreds of nanometers, while in the FIPSEM, for example, we are working with five nanometer se sections, this, um, we cannot just put the two data sets together. We need uh, fiducial markers again here to be able to um, um, put the two data sets together and actually transform one of them to make sure that it fits nicely. So for that, for cells, we um, use MitoTracker. So that's the staining that you put on the cells when they're still living. Um, and after fixation, um, you can nicely see the mitochondria. So they are fluorescent. Um, we use this um, in addition to uh, the protein or structure of interest of our users. Um, um, and then uh, based on the shape of the mitochondria, we can find back the same area of the cell. Uh, and then to make an overlay between the two data sets, we use a software, um, a plugin in Fiji um, called Big Warp, where you can put landmarks on specific um, uh, structures inside these cells. And then the LM data set is transformed to fit on top of the EM. <clears throat> now, um, uh, for this project is actually uh, exactly what we did. So for uh, Josephine, our user uh, in our institute, we were looking at uh, the localization of ZBP1 aggregates in the cell. So ZBP1 is a nucleic acid sensor that forms aggregates upon viral infection. Uh, and this way it triggers cell death to avoid viral replication. Um, and so we use the, the channel where the mitochondrial staining was in to uh, do our big warp, make the landmarks and transform the LM data set and did the same transformation on the green channel to be able to localize the aggregates that she was looking for. So in this way, um, the transformation is done completely independent of the protein or structure of interest. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> now is uh, for tissue. Um, these kinds of experiments are a little bit less straightforward as we cannot put a grid on it. So we need other ways to find a region of interest in tissue. And sometimes that's easy because of the shape of the tissue, but that's not always the case. So um, a few years ago, when uh, Martin and Johnny from our um, institute came to us, uh, they were looking at uh, Kupfer cells. So these are the resident macrophages in the liver. And in fluorescence, you could see they were 
uh, situated near blood vessels, sometimes going in or not, and they're always co-localized with these other cell type, the stellate cells. And they were interested in what is going on here. How do these cells interact? Are they actually close together or is there something in between? It's all the things that we couldn't see in the light microscopy data. <clears throat> now, to be able to target a specific Cooper cell, we um, decided to use near infrared branding. So this is a method that was already published in 2012 where the multi-photon laser of a confocal microscope is used to brand scars into the tissue. So in the EM, you see it really that all the tissue is gone. And we've already used this before um, in Drosophila ventral nerve cord, uh, where we made these branding marks to find a specific neuron. Um, but here, the shape of the tissue, so use the gray outline, gray outline you see, is actually the shape of the tissue, made it quite easy to always find back the same lobe of the brain. Um, but in liver, where we're working with fibrotome sections, which are rather big and quite consistent in shape, um, this was a little bit more difficult, so we needed to find another um, way to do that. So what we did in the end is in the liver tissue, uh, we found our cupra cell, and then we branded these five lines in the shape of an arrow. And then also two lines here, two smaller lines uh, delineating like the region of interest here. <laughs> So after branding, we made a high-resolution stack that also included the branding marks. <clears throat> um, and then um, our quite big fibrotome section was uh, cut into a smaller piece that included our region of interest, the branding marks, and a little bit more. Um, ideally, some marks like this blood vessel here when we cut a corner just to keep uh, track of the orientation. After EM processing, it becomes completely black, but in this case, the blood vessel here um, helped us quite a lot. Um, so after it was embedded in resin, we made this little block here out of it, making sure that the branding marks were really at the top um, of the block here. And this was mounted onto a serial block face um, uh, SEM pin. Um, but the mounting was actually done 19 degrees turned, so uh, it's perpendicular to your uh, confocal imaging um, plane. Yes, so this made sure that when we started imaging and hit the marks, we're not in our region of interest yet. So if you do this the other way around, you see might see the lines in full, but once you hit the lines, you don't know if you're started uh, cutting away your cell yet or not. So this way, it was more safe for us to follow the lines down um, to our region of interest. So in the SEM, it looked like that. So we had this five holes in a row. Not always easy to find because sometimes they look a lot like, blo like blood vessels. <clears throat> but we were able to follow them down. We knew how long uh, the branding marks were. And in the end, you also find these small orientation marks on the sides. Now, I call them orientation marks. So they were here and here. You see, it's difficult to say it's a branding mark, but we were following them, so we could know. Um, and you see that this one is a little bit more to the surface than that one. So that helps later on with orientation for overlaying the two data sets. And also made us uh, let us know that our um, imaging window and the serial block phase needed to include them both, but not much more, because the region of interest is in between here. <clears throat> So in the end, we have the two data sets, the light microscopy and the uh, EM. The EM needs to be resliced because we turned the block around. Um, but after that, we have the branding marks here at the top, and we can um, find the same area in both data sets. Now, the branding marks alone are not enough as fiducial marks to overlay a 3D data set like this. So um, after some experimentation, we found a way. So we injected the fluorescent dye in the blood vessels so that all the blood vessels were stained. And in EM, they're also clearly visible. So we could use like all the branching points in the blood vessels as landmarks in this big warp um, plugin in Fiji. And then we're able to make um, the overview, overview. Now this year was our cell of interest and we tried to get the blood vessels uh, as nicely fitting surrounding this, uh, but it was quite a bit, diff bit more difficult than we expected in the beginning, mainly because um, 
if we go back a bit, this mounting on the block is all done manually. So it's never exactly 90 degrees. So you're never exactly in the right plane. Um, so you see here that there's some blast vessels that don't fit very well. Um, at the moment, for other projects also, we are working together with the image processing group here in the building, and they have um, made blood vessel maps of both uh, the segmentation from the EM and um, the fluorescence. And when they um, transform, well, we'll calculate the transformation based on that. Um, it's actually a lot more fitting than we would get with the landmarks. Um, so um, that's something we're still working on. Um, to get that uh, available and uh, for all our experiments. But they, they look really a lot nicer than that. <clears throat> so in the end, for the Kupfer cell, we were able to um, overlay this. So here, the fluorescence is in red uh, for the Kupfer cell. So we could really point out in the EM data set, OK, this is the right cell. Because the Kupfer cells themselves, they don't have any specific features. So you don't really, you can't really say from the EM, from this is for sure. Um, this type of cell. Um, and in, we found that it's closely, um, that the cell body is not inside the blood vessels, but outside, but it does reach into the blood vessels here on the side. And it's indeed very close, closely um, engaging with this stellate cell in green here. Now, the next experiment they did, um, just sh I'm just going to show that quickly. Um, is where they depleted all the Kupfer cells. Um, and then the monocytes that are um, traveling around uh, in the bloodstream actually uh, come and take over. So you see this monocyte here, the cell body is still inside the blood vessel, but it's already reaching out into the space where the Kupfer cell used to be. And the stellate cell is actually wrapping around it, probably guiding the cell to come in. Um, yeah, so that was a... Uh, something really cool. OK, so that's um, basically everything I wanted to show you um, from our work. Uh, just this one slide um, promoting a little bit our um, the a workshop we are organizing. So um, in 20, March 2024, we are again organizing the from 3D light to 3D electromicroscopy workshop. We're doing this together with uh, the uh, people from the Crick and EMBL and SAIS as a sponsor. So there are uh, really nice talks. There are 10 different work, hands-on workshops on CLEM and Volume EM. So um, with the QR code, you get to the website and get more information. That just um, leads me to thank all my colleagues uh, here, these names on the side, Femke, Michiel and Riet are my EM team. And then Yari, Amanda and Eve, Eve and Jeremy are uh, the people working on the light microscopy. So thank you very much. <laughs>